right, uh, welcome back to the Drop Table. Thank you. You did buy your girlfriend a birthday present, I heard. Oh, uh, yeah, I Yeah, that's why it's gone for a week. Okay. It's rough. That's... Get her something for Christmas, for the holiday, okay? Yeah, Don't... Sure. She's a good woman. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Uh, what's up for you guys? All right, so this is the last week of classes. Uh, the Project 4 is still due. Homework 5 will be due. Um, and then on Wednesday's class, we'll have the system potpourri and uh, the final review. And I'll also be announcing the result of the paternity test uh, <laughs> about my kid, and it, well, whether or not it's mine, we'll see. All right, so I'll announce that at the end of class on Wednesday as well. All right, before we switch over to the guest speaker, any questions about what's remaining for the rest of the semester for you guys? Yes? The extra credit is due uh, the same day as Project 4. It should be on the website. And we'll send out the feedback for the extra credit uh, uh, probably tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay? Any other questions? All right, guys. So we're super excited today to have uh, Shashank from Oracle uh, to come give a guest lecture. And again, like I said, the reason why I like having him here is because it's going to make me not seem crazy that I didn't tell you all these things about databases and just, just didn't make things up. He's going to say, oh, yeah, here's a real system. They're making lots of money. It does all the things that we talked about this, this, uh, this semester. But he's going to talk about it in the context of an in-memory database, which is not what we talked about, uh, but it's going to apply the same concept just in a, in a different environment. And if you're interested in the kind of things he's talking about today, this is what the advanced class 15721 will be entirely about uh, next semester. Okay? So Shashank is a vice president of in-memory database technologies. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so he has an undergraduate and a master's degree from UC San Diego, and he's been at Oracle for six years, nine years? Nine years? Nine years. Uh -huh. Okay? And again, like, he, this is a real dude working on the system. This isn't some marketing <laughs> This is real. So by all means, stop and ask him hard technical questions, push him, and to see whether he actually knows what he's talking about. Okay? Damn. <laughs> Damn. Go for it. Let me fix the light, too. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Hey, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Shashank Chavan. Uh, I come here every now and then. I guess the, there's a PDL lab that they come here for the retreats. And uh, I think it's like winter and spring, I think. And um, Andy's kind enough to invite me. So thank you again for inviting me here. So today's talk is going to be on this top five innovations of Oracle's database and memory. So this talk was initially given to folks that actually know about the database and memory product. Um, I kind of changed it a little bit to kind of give you guys a background on what database and memory is. Um, like Andy said, please feel free to stop me at any point in time, anytime you have a question, I have no problems. I, as I was telling Andy, I usually have more slides than I have time for to talk, so sometimes I talk too fast. Um, so just interrupt me anytime you want to, okay? Um, okay, so let me see. I just want to make sure I'm following the slides appropriately. Okay, great. So that's my next slide. All right, so I like to start off with this motivation slide. This is talking about real-time enterprises need in-memory innovations now. Okay, so this was the, the slide that I have currently. What I really wanted to show was this slide with our presidents tweeting in the morning, call to arms, real-time enterprises need in-memory innovations now, but I was told it would be too political, so I opted for this instead, but I actually like this one better because it's real. It actually is very true. Did he really say call to arms? He literally said that. Today? No. Oh. <laughs> no, he didn't say it. This is actually when uh, the impeachment trial started, I think, is when uh, we put the slide together. But the reality is the following. Real-time enterprises are enterprises that need access to data now. They're data-driven. They are agile. They're efficient. They want to be able to react instantly to data. So you can imagine there are a bunch of enterprises that fit this category, right? Like insurance companies retailers, manufacturing processes, financial services, people need to do fraud detection in real time. Actually, this just happened. Yesterday I was buying um, some speakers at Best Buy because they're on sale. And literally after I made that purchase, I got a, a text message that says, are you certain that you want to make this purchase? Did you make this purchase? Blah, blah, blah. Because they immediately know that I'm not one, the kind of person that makes a $500 purchase you know, uh, on, on the spur of the moment. That's just not me. Um, so anyways, that, that's real time. And so in order to achieve that, we need a lot of things to come in place. So we, we see the demand that's coming from enterprise companies, right? So what's actually making this possible? So if you look at the hardware trends, okay, you're starting to have larger, cheaper memory. So DRAM, everybody's familiar with memory. 
PMEM, I don't know how many of you are familiar with persistent memory. Um, I talk about that on the last bullet there, so I'll get to that then. You have larger CPU caches. So now we're talking about 32 megabytes of shared L3 cache on Intel's latest processors. You have larger multi-core processors, so 24 cores with Intel Cascade Lake. Larger SIMD vector processing units. Show of hands of folks who know what SIMD is. Have you heard of that before? Single instruction multiple data? Excellent. Okay. So now you have 512-bit SIMD registers that can parallelize your operations um, essentially in, the sing in a single cycle. Faster networks, so you have 100 gigabit per second Rocky versus the 40 gigabit per second that you have with uh, InfiniBand. NUMA architectures, so that you have now you have to concentrate on local memory versus remote memory. So there's a, a bunch of factors. Persistent memory is really the biggest in my mind, and, and at Oracle and of our group, we think is a, a, a big time game changer um, in the memory technology space. So persistent memory is basically like DRAM. It's just like memory, except it's a lot larger, about three x times the uh, the size of, of DRAM. Um, it's got availability because it's persistent. You you pull the plug, you you put the plug back in. The data is still there, sitting in in these uh, persistent memory DIMMs, and it's it's fast. It's not faster than DRAM, but it's way faster than flash. So it's got a lot of really cool qualities, and all of these things combined help us move towards uh, meeting the requirements of real-time enterprises. So their last project is on logging recovery, doing ARIES. So think about this. Like you're, you're writing your, your ability to, to write out dirty pages from your buffer pool. With persistent memory, you don't have to do project four, if it existed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. OK. Um, where do we have in memory today? OK, so we have different tiers. So the top tier here is application tier. This is where you care about an immediate response time. So imagine you have an application, and you're going to link this database directly into your application. Shares the same process space, the memory space, everything is shared. And so you're going to get immediate response time. This is extremely important if you're like OLTP sensitive, and you want to do an insert very quickly or a read very quickly, and you're just getting a, a value for this particular key. So that's times 10. Times 10 came out years ago. It was one of the first in memory, I think it was the first in memory uh, database out. I think it was about, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. Or so when it, when it was first, 96? OK, much longer than that. Um, so that's, that's uh, times 10. That's in the application tier. The database tier is what I'm going to talk about. That's where we have Oracle database in memory. And this is where we really care about analytics, but we also mix workload performance. And it's embedded directly into a real working enterprise database. Um, and then you're processing things at billions of rows per second when you're looking at analytics. Um, then there's also the storage tier. So I'll talk about that as well. And by the storage tier, I mean it's where the data is actually residing, whether it be on, on disk in some persistent store, or on flash, or something close to basically a, a persistent store. So yeah, the application tier, database tier, storage tier. And I'll talk mostly about the database tier and the, the storage tier, OK? OK. So I'm going to start off with a background on what Oracle Database in Memory is. OK, let's start with some basics. Okay. So before we had columnar databases, which is the next slide, we basically have row databases. Row-wise databases are fantastic if you care about transactions. Okay. So as an example, you're an ATM machine. You have your ATM card. You want to deduct $25, $20 from your account. That's a transaction that you're applying. You're going to quickly search through this gigantic database of you know, millions or billions of, of users, not billions, but certainly many millions, and search for your particular account, find your balance, and deduct $20 from it. So that's like looking for a specific row and potentially, top, uh, uh, potentially accessing multiple columns within that row. That's great for, that's transaction processing. So row base is very good for accessing a particular row and then touching multiple columns within that row. So as an example here, if you're running this query like select column 4 from my table, what you have to do is you basically have to process each row and hop to column 4 to get to it. right? So the problems when it comes to analytics is you're basically visiting every single row, but on top of that, you're going column by column, column touching multiple cache lines to get to the column that you care about. So it's, again, fantastic if you want to get to a specific row and access a specific column. That's row format. Now, column row format is fast for analytics. Okay, Analytics is where you say, 
I actually care about visiting all the rows, but I'm only interested in certain columns, right? So in this case now, if I just want to say select column four from my table, all I need to do is visit column four, okay? The data is stored in columns in contiguous memory. Each column here is in a contiguous piece of memory. Any questions so far, the difference between row format and column format? We can do that. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so the, the innovation on our end, what Oracle developed for our in-memory product is we decided that you can't just have one or the other. It's just not feasible really for enterprise companies. Enterprises are basically more interested in mixed workloads. Sometimes they're running analytics, sometimes they're running transactions. Sometimes, um, and it could be very mixed. Sometimes they run ad hoc queries, these gigantic queries. Sometimes they're very, very simple queries. So it's a mix. And so we basically decided that you're not, you can't basically choose one format. We basically want to have both formats. And so that's why we have this thing called dual format architecture. So with dual format architecture, we basically maintain both the traditional row store that's sitting in your buffer cache, as well as a columnar representation that's sitting in memory. Okay, we maintain both. And both of them are simultaneously active and consistent with each other. All the brains goes into the optimizer. The optimizer decides when it sees the query which path it should take. So for example, if it sees a query that says, I really want to get to this particular row, this key, and, and extract that value, and I have this OLTP index on it, the optimizer will say, go to the buffer cache and fetch the index block for it and read that row. And that's how fast it'll, it'll get that row. If the query is an, an analytic query, and you're doing some kind of crazy aggregation or group by sum or some joins or whatever it is, it'll use the column store. Okay? Um, so it's for us, when we developed this uh, database in memory, we built it natively into the database. So it's not a separate storage engine, it's part of the existing storage engine. It's basically just a think of the, the columnar representation as if it was an index, an index that resides in, in memory. Okay? Any qu question? So, like you just said that, uh, like uh, you are using best of both when you are doing read, right? So, if you have an old OLTP thing, you will do the row thing, and if you have to scan the whole column. But say you are doing write, then it will be the worst of both things. No, so if it, de it depends on <coughs> what the percentage of writes are to the, your workload. So, I, I'll cover that in a second in terms of how we handle writes or or updates or whatever or DML in general. If you're doing, let's say, 1% of your workload is writes, okay? That's not a problem. That's basically a mixed workload. Ten, even 5 to 10% is fine. When, when you start getting to a higher percentage, like 20, 30, 40%, maybe, let's say, this is not the right solution for you because now, uh, as you'll see, you're basically, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know how that advanced. Ah, uh, you know, I'm probably, you're probably running with the timer. There you got it. Okay. Keep talking. Okay. Um, so what you're doing is you're basically maintaining both, right? You're maintaining this column store and the row store, and that could become problematic, okay? So I'll, I'll describe how we handle that very efficiently. Any other questions? Okay. You were this one or next one? Next one. Let me make sure it's still okay. You're good. All right, cool. We can all that up. Awesome. All right. Let's go into some of the details, okay, in terms of how we store this data. So what you see here is a, a table. Uh, we store the data in a very impure memory columnar representation. Um, so sales table continues to sit on disk. Doesn't change, right? It's, it's as exactly as you guys know it to be. It can be pulled into the buffer cache if it's accessed. Um, that doesn't change. But what you do is if you say bring this table into in memory, we will basically bring it into in memory. We'll take the rows, transpose them into columns, and then store the columns into blocks of contiguous pieces of memory. Okay, there's no changes to the disk format. Uh, we, we're Oracle, so we support all, all platforms. You can enable in memory at any level, okay, at the table space level, at the tables, at a column level even. You can specify it at any level. And the only thing you do need to do is you need to tell us how much memory you want to reserve for your column store. Okay, that's, as I, I'll talk about some of the future stuff we're working on, but that's a, the only thing you really have to do is tell us how much memory. Now, if we dive in deeper into this, okay, we basically 
block out these rows in something called IMCUs, or in-memory compression units. Okay, IMCU, in-memory compression units. And an IMCU basically has about a half a million rows, half a million to a, a million rows. And within each IMCU, you have all the columns for that table. So here in this uh, sales table here, you have the employee ID, name, department, salary. Okay, we also have this row ID column. Now this is really important. This is kind of the, the, the little trick that we have. That row ID column maps to the actual locations of those rows on disk, which is this bottom part here. So on disk, we basically store data in extents, which are basically contiguous pieces of blocks. And this extent says, extent number 13 has blocks 20 to 120. Extent number 14 has blocks 82 to 182. And in each block you have like, you know, some you know, hundreds, hundreds or thousands of, of rows. And um, so this IMCU is mapped directly to the, the physical locations on disk. And why this is important is because when you have a modification to a row, it's very easy to say which IMCU does that map to. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through a, um, a, another slide that talks about how we utilize this when we talk about uh, DML. So the only other point to make here is you can specify how you want to compress this column. So you know, I don't think you guys talked about compression yet or different data formats. Any of you guys heard of dictionary encoding before or prefix encoding? Okay, so we'll, I think I have a, a few slides on this. But you can specify what compression levels you want. You're limited to on, on memory, so you can bring it into to memory and compress it however you, which way you want to. Okay, so that's how we store things as IMC. Ah, here's the slide on, on uh, compression. So how do we actually store this data? Okay, so imagine this was your column. Okay, this is your uncompressed data, and I have cat, cat, fish, fish, horse, 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 dog, dog, cat, etc. Okay, it's not actually sorted. I have dogs here and cats here, but this is just my example. So the first thing we do is we dictionary encode this. So what dictionary encoding means is it identifies the distinct symbols in that column, pulls out those distinct symbols, and then sorts those distinct symbols, and then assigns a code to them. So you have cat, dog, fish, horse. That's all you have in this, in this column. I sort them, and I assign them codes of 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then you just have to replace the values of cat, cat, fish, fish, etc., with the codes themselves. And we take it one step further we actually bit pack those codes. So because there are only four distinct symbols there, I only need two bits, right, to, to represent uh, each one of those symbols. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, et cetera. Okay, so far so good. So that's dictionary encoding. The next thing we do is we apply RLE or run length encoding. Run length encoding is basically saying, let me see if I can identify a run of the same symbol n number of times and replace all n copies with a single copy along with the run, right? A count. So here, you notice how we have cat cat and fish fish, or rather zero 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 and one zero and one zero. Well, I can replace that with just zero zero and one zero, and then I have a run over there. Is this little button the the? the... It should be yeah. There you go, perfect. So then you can see then you just basically maintain some runs that just identifies how many runs there are for those symbols. So far so good? Okay. Then we take it one step further. We apply something called OZIP or Oracle Zip. Um, Oracle Zip is very uh, much, it's pretty much a fancy dictionary encoding algorithm. But it's fantastic because it's very simple and it's, uh, it's hardware friendly to decompress. Uh, I won't go into too many details besides describing what's happening here. So what it's doing is it's now finding patterns within the, the encoded the values now. So here you have 00101101 and you see the same pattern of 00101101. So you'll replace these set of, of 8 bits now with a single code of 0 or a single bit of 0 and you'll replace 01 with 1 and now you've compressed it even further. So you're building a, yet another dictionary on top of the encoded stream. So far so good? Okay, so that's what we do. We take it to kind of an extreme, and then you can actually take this and you put Z, Zlib on top of it, or Bzip, or whatever, a high, higher level compressor on top of it. Okay? 
All right, one more compression form I want to talk about is something called prefix encoding. So we talked about that dictionary, right, of a cat, dog, horse, etc. Notice how they were all sorted. Well, so once it's sorted, you can actually remove a common prefixes from adjacent symbols and store them separately. So the example I have here in this dictionary is used, used, useful, usefully, usefulness, etc. Right? And they all have use, but some of the symbols can actually benefit from something more, like useful. So what we'll do is we'll basically take out maybe like a block of eight symbols. And then from those eight symbols, we'll find the, the, the common prefix across those eight symbols. In this example, I think I'm using two symbols. So use for use, and then D is the suffix for used. So I just maintain the prefix along with an empty suffix here for the first symbol and D for the second one. And then the next one will use useful um, because the third symbol here is useful and the same thing. And it you know, grabs the suffixes. So this just gives you some more compression. So far, so good? Okay. Problem with this stuff is the following, right? You have to decompress it, and that could take some time. You can't just point to use and D because you have to stitch them up at some point and give it back to whatever operator wants the actual symbol. So there's a cost associated with compressing and then decompressing as a result. But. So, like the execution engine, like, like for the Rose or an Oracle, is not compression aware. So you have to decompress it when you hand it off to it. Or you, you, have, have, you have specialized it, ones for the column store. For the column store, we have specialized formats where we like uh, we know what the format is. You don't have to decompress it. We have some tricks to, like for example, for dictionary encoding, for prefix encoding, we have tricks that use SIMD that that allow you to not have to ever stitch things back together when you're doing a scan. So you, when you're doing a projection, you do. Rose store doesn't have that. Rose store, Rose store has a, a compressor very much like dictionary encoding, but it operates across multiple rows and it's far more complex. So you're right, when you actually have to project back, it's a complicated stitching algorithm to bring it back together again. All right, so far so good? Okay, all right, so we talked about how we bring the data into memory. We talked about how we format it and compress it. Now we're gonna talk about how do we scan, how do we actually use that data and actually scan fast? How do we get to this billions of rows per second versus the millions of rows per second when you're looking at, at a buffer cache in a row store? So this is where SIMD comes into play. So SIMD, again, for those of you who don't know, stands for single instruction, multiple data. And what that does is a lot of most modern processors now, now for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years maybe, I don't know, since 96, I think, um, have a, um, in, in the processor, have a vector uh, a vectorization unit where they have very fat registers, and not only do they have those fat registers, they have a sequence of they have a, a instruction set that can be applied on those register, registers <clears throat> that allow you to parallelize data operations. So let's just go through an example to make things clear. Here you have again your column store, and you have a column called state, right? And <clears throat> your query is find sales in state of California. So what you're going to do is bring the state column into a register. Now, you guys, we just talked about dictionary encoding, right? So these state columns can all be packed into how many bits do you guys think? Quick thinkers. Whatever, whatever 64. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's right. So you got, uh, was that, five bits or six bits? Thank you. Six bits. So six bits coming in here, but you have a register, let's say it's 512 bits. So I can bring in 64 of these, assuming all of them are 8 bits, let's just say, right? I can bring 64 in a 512 bit register, 64 states can be loaded at once. That's one instruction. Some number of cycles, depending on whether it's in, in your CPU cache or not, but let's suppose it is in your CPU cache, okay? So it's one cycle, I've loaded them in here. The next step is to bring in California, whatever bit representation California is, and splat that across another register. California, 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 etc. Then, I, and that's one cycle, okay? Then, this is where I use the, the instruction set for, vector, for, for, for uh, vector registers here, where I can do a vector compare all values in one cycle. So, this state will be compared to California. This state will be compared to California, etc., etc. And in one cycle, it will apply 64 comparisons resulting in a bit mask of 64 bits. 
And that tells me which of these 64 states were equal to California. So just think about Project 3. Project 3, you had to do a volcano style iterator, right? You're calling next on, on one tuple at a time. That You cannot do that in a single cycle, right? To go do 64 tuples would be, you know, a, a next call 64 times, which is super expensive. This is why if you use a vectorized processing model, which is what they're doing here, take a bunch of crap all at once and then, then do the filter, do the predicate evaluation very quickly. So that's why they're getting 100x faster over what you guys wrote in project three. Right. <laughs> make, make you feel really good <laughs> about your work. <laughs> that's why you guys are 100x slower. Learn. <laughs> Okay, um, but, 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 but Andy is right. We actually apply vectorization techniques to all of our operators, okay? So because the, 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 there's magic in this. Um, it's, it's complicated, not when I'll have a slide on this, I think. But um, so let's move on here. Okay, so that brings me to this slide here. So we really looking to improve all aspects of analytics. So we talked about scans just now with vectorization, joins, we look at vectorizing joins as well. There's all sorts of nifty techniques when you're dealing with a column store and you're dealing with dictionary encoding. You can leverage the format, leverage the hardware to again process at the, at the billions of rows per second. Here we make joins faster by simply making something called bloom filters faster. Show of hands of folks who know about bloom filters. Excellent. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Bloom filters are magic. I love them. Um, anyway, so, so that's how we make joins faster initially with our first release from five years ago. Um, and then reporting, aggregations, group by sum, things like that. Okay? okay. Yep. I, I, when we discussed hash joins, I, I mentioned that balloon filter optimization, that's, where, that's the 10x right there, right? Yep. Okay. The, I mean, this is using SIMD on top of it. Okay, let's move on here. Okay, so now we finally get to the top five, which is uh, what I wanted to get to. So, top five, I just want to list five the things that uh, we have done in the, um, in the last five years, I guess. Um, that I think stand out in terms of what makes database and memory kind of cool uh, for us at least. Okay? Um, and by the way, a lot of these, most of these resulted in academic papers that we submitted to various different conferences, so I'll, I'll point them out to you as we, as we move along. So the first thing is the dual format architecture. Fast mixed workloads and faster analytics. Why we think this is uh, pretty innovative. So let's explain how it works, okay? So the dual format architecture enables fast mixed workloads and faster analytics. So if you look at your right, that was our, um, our drawing that I showed to you last time. Now, uh, you can get very fast in-memory DML because the invalid row is logically removed from the column store. So I'm going to walk through this example. Let's suppose that a row was modified, okay? So that row was modified for whatever reason, maybe a column in there or some number of columns, but it was updated or is deleted, whatever it is. That happens on the normal path, okay? Like it normally does, like Oracle's been doing for the last 30, 40 years. Now, when that happens, that tells us immediately using that row ID CU, remember how I told you we map from disk to the column store? We can immediately just set a bit that says that row is invalid. That doesn't take that long. You guys have all set bits if you've done, if you create a bloom filter. It doesn't take long. You do have to find that IMCU. That's a little bit of a lookup, but not that long. And then you just set a bit. So that's how DMLs work. Super simple. You just say this row in that column store is invalid. So now what happens? When you want to do a scan, you just ignore the invalid rows. Okay? So here's my example. Let's say I'm doing a full table scan. I just go whoop, and I just sidestep that invalid row and I keep going. Now, what happens? I sidestep that row, but that's not giving me a consistent result now. I have to actually process that row. So just for that row, I will go to disk or the buffer cache to fetch that row. Okay. Now, in all likelihood, it's probably in the buffer cache because I've updated it or I've done something. Updating it brings that block into the buffer cache. And so I'm still technically processing at memory speeds because the buffer cache is in memory, but I'm going against the row store, right? Now, IMCUs not covering invalid rows are unaffected. So that's when you break up your data into blocks, it's got a lot of value to it. The blocks that aren't affected, they'll still go through a nice, you know, proper a vector scan, the SIMD scans that we just, we just talked about. Okay, 
This is an important point. Mixed workload performance can suffer if the number of invalid rows accumulates in your IMCUs, which goes to, to your point over there earlier. If the rows start to get really dirty, then I'm just going to the buffer cache all the time. I'm, I'm not leveraging the, the columnar representation. So this is where fast repopulation techniques save the day. So let's go through, let's explain this for a second. So we do something called Continuous intelligence, okay, this is actually an anal analyst term. Continuous intelligence just means that we will track how dirty your IMCU is how, and how frequently it is scanned. We do a combination of it. And I'll explain why. We care about both, how dirty it is and how frequently is it scanned. If your IMCU is super dirty, lots of updates are happening, but you're never scanning it, I don't necessarily care to, to refresh it or, or repopulate it. No one's actually accessing it. So it's some combination of it that we have an algorithm for that decides when we should refresh it. So the first technique we have is something called double buffering. So with double buffering, the idea here is when you have an IMCU that's dirty, you need to refresh it. So we keep the dirty one around and in the background, we'll create a new one that brings in those dirty rows, repopulates it, and now has a nice fresh copy of the IMCU. And once it's ready, we do that switcheroo, and the old one goes out and the new one comes in, right? The main reason why we want to do this is because we don't want your queries to suffer by taking it offline. Every operation, if you, if you uh, learn a few things, I guess, in, in database classes, you really want to try to keep everything online. You never want to bring something down and then suffer a slower performance while you're refreshing an index or, in this case, refreshing the, the IMCU. Anybody understand that? Double offering? Okay. The second thing is incremental repopulation, what we call incremental repopulation. The idea here is you can construct a new column leveraging the information from the old column. So for example, when you do a tra when you're actually going from row store to column store, it's very expensive. Population, we call that population to bring it into memory. The, it's very expensive to identify the distinct symbols. You basically are going to use a hash table or a, a, an art. You guys heard of art? Adaptive rate tree. Okay. Okay. Um, an index or something. Like, Radix tree. We call it yeah. Radix tree. You need something to identify. Give me my distinct symbols. It, it's expensive to do that. And so what you want to do is leverage the fact that, hey, I, I have already created a dictionary before. I just have some, some dirty rows here. So you leverage that to build the, the new CU, the new column, column CU. Okay, so that's incremental repopulation. And the last thing here that we do as a, a little trick here is oftentimes when you are invalidating a row, invalid means you're updating it, deleting or whatever, you're really just touching a column or some number of columns. You're not actually touching all the columns. And so if you run a query that's unaffected by, by the columns because you're only accessing those columns that were not affected, then you can still go columnar, right? You don't have to worry about the, the accessing the invalid rows. Okay, so these three kind of techniques here allow us to really run mixed workloads faster. And it gives us this best of, of both worlds. Is the like, um, like when you say like I, I want to build an IMCU on a, on a column or a table? Yeah. Like it's all or nothing. Like you, you, there's no, there's no paging. It's like it's like either the table fits or it doesn't fit. No. So that's so from the very beginning, Oracle. We've always said that you can't assume that everything's going to fit in memory. That's just that's not realistic. So so what happens is if you have a limited whatever memory you have, you'll populate that. Bring it into memory. Anything that doesn't fit will stay on disk. Okay. Now you, like I said, you have the ultimate control. You can say which columns you want. You can say which partitions you want. It's whatever not, it is. It's not like a buffer cache where like you have a, you have a eviction no. policy. No. No. Like sucks in much as it can. Because all right, I'm done. Exactly. It's a it's a store. It's a column store. Got it. Okay. So it's not a cache. Now we'll t I'll talk to you about how we're transitioning over to actually making it a cache when we're doing storage tiering and things like that. Okay. Okay. All right. So far so good. Doing all right on time. This is a very quick slide. I'm just gonna skip through the animation here, and this is just telling you how. Oh, question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, in the previous slide, like, uh, like why do you need uh, both the workloads, the row base and the column base? Because ultimately, you are uh, using the column storage, and 
processing your columns. So what you're doing is like bringing in uh, to memory the row base and the column base boot. Isn't it an efficient? Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, let me let me. Okay. So I think the question was is that if you're bringing, it sounds like you're bringing both the row row format column uh, data and the column their data into memory. And it sounds like that's inefficient to basically have two versions of your data in in, in memory. And, and plus you, you need to keep it up, like both in the same. You, and you need to keep them in sync and up to date, right? Okay. So so that okay. So let me see if I can answer this appropriately. If you're depending on your workload, you might be a, an analytic heavy workload. If you're an analytic heavy workload, you're never going to bring the row formatted data into the buffer cache. Make sense? You're only going to leverage what's in the column store and you're done. If you're an OLTP heavy, all you're doing is transactions, inserts, updates, deletes. You're not doing uh, joins or aggreg you know, aggregations or anything. You're never going to even bring it into the column store. That makes sense. So, so that's the the two extremes. Now, the middle ground is when you have some percentage of DML, some percentage of scans. Now, where in memory is going to be beneficial is, of course, if you're more heavily towards the scans than you are to the DML. Now, the DML is going to bring thing blocks into the buffer cache, but it's not going to bring the whole table into the buffer cache. Does that make sense? And so you are going to occasionally go down the row store because you're just looking for a row and you're going to use an index to get to that. Or you're going to do analytics and go through all those. So that's the, the difference. Got it? Okay, question. Um, so you said you only bring in that portion of the table that fits in the memory. But if yes. you're doing a scan across the a longer column to do an, an analytical query, what do you do like, when you want the rest of the table? Good question. So the question is, is that um, since we don't, bring, we don't have to bring everything into memory, what happens when you're doing a full table scan and you're actually to access something that's not in memory? That's your question. So it's no different than what I was mentioning about the invalid rows. If you have an invalid row, you have to go to disk to go get it. So it's the same concept. Imagine you have, so you filled up 50% of your data in memory and you have those in IMCUs. Imagine you have the other 50% as empty IMCUs or dirty IMCUs, just, you know, if you can envision that, then you're always going to disk to fetch those 50% of the rows. That's the behavior that you'll have. So you'll get everything that you can from memory in the column store, and you'll get the rest from disk or the buffer cache. Got it? Remember, and you can compress the hell out of these things. So you can fit as much as you can. Excuse me. So I didn't mean to say that. But you can, you can, you can say what I want. OK. Yeah, I have to bleed it because the department makes you bleed it. That's right. OK. That's bombs. I don't care. All right. There it is. Uh, but you can you can compress it, bring it in, in, into you want, uh, it, bring everything you uh, you can into memory if you can. Okay, moving on. All right, so this is I'll just blaze through this, but this is a very kind of an ob somewhat obvious point for me because I, I explain it all the time, but may not be so obvious to others. How do we get mixed workloads to run so much faster without doing much, but just having a column store? So normally, when you have a, a mixed workload, you'll have here's a table. You have one to three OLTP indexes. Okay, OLTP indexes, again, indexes on columns like key columns, primary key columns that you're really quickly trying to get to the, the values of. Um, and then you have 10 to 20 analytic indexes because for all the columns that you want to run analytics on, you're going to have a, a separate index for that. Now, you can basically throw away those analytic indexes altogether and just maintain the column store. And anytime there's an update, as I mentioned, you can very quickly mark a bit that says this guy's been updated, this guy's been deleted. So because it's in memory, the, the updates are very quickly uh, to indicate uh, um, a, a, a DML has happened. Okay, and that's how, and so now you don't pay the cost of updating all of these analytic indexes for every update um, that you have to your, to your table. All right, number two, um, vectorized analytics. So we touched upon this briefly, right, with the SIMD scans. Um, I'm going to walk through that a little bit more in detail in terms of how that works. So parallelized predicate evaluation, load, eval, store, consume, result. These are the steps that you take when you want to evaluate a predicate. So let's just go through a quick example. So let's say you have this select count star from table T where A is greater than 10 and B is less than 20, right? So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to load A. And you're going to bring four values into a SIMD register. 
right? Then, as I mentioned, you're going to splat 10 across that SIMD register. Then you're going to do a comparison, greater than, greater than, greater than, greater than, all in one cycle, and you got, you know, a bit vector that says 1101. Then you do the same thing for B. You load B, you compare it to 20, and that's the bit vector that you have for it. And now you just need to add those two bit vectors together, and now you have the final set 0101. Now that is actually not completely done because that's stored in a SIMD register. Four bits are stored in a 128 bit register. I don't want to waste 128 bits to store four bits. So you basically pack them. That's another instruction that the, that the SIMD instruction set supports that packs them into just four bits, literally four bits. And then you store that, you know, wherever or utilize that on the, and then for the next predicate. So that's, you know, a, a little more details uh, of, of how SIMD operations work. Okay, so not just scans, but we're also making joins faster. So bloom filters, you guys are familiar with bloom filters. The way we make bloom filters even faster, it's a combination of things. We apply the bloom filter on the dictionary first. That's the first thing, because you only need to run it on the distinct symbols. You don't need to run it on all the values. And once you run it on the distinct symbols, you need to map them back to those uh, symbols that map to those codes. Second thing that we make bloom filters faster is we vectorize the operations. We use SIMD to basically do a set membership lookup that says within a bit vector, find, uh, determine if this value is set in this, in this bit vector. This slide doesn't talk about bloom filters. This takes it to the next level. This is saying, if you can tell me which two columns across two tables you plan on joining against, okay, and that's what we call this join group. If you say, hey, um, you're going to join between vehicles and sales on this name column. Now, once you tell me that or tell us that, we will encode both of these columns using the same dictionary. Okay. Without this, we, will, we don't know that these two are related. And so we'll basically have a separate dictionary for this guy, a separate dictionary for this guy, and they can have different codes depending on how the IMCUs are broken up. And so once they have different codes, they don't relate to each other anymore. Like code five here doesn't match code eight here, even though five and eight are both um, out uh, BMW or whatever this, this is vehicle's name, there, BMW or whatever. So once you tell us this, we will use the same dictionary to map the codes. And now you're just doing a code to code match. You're not doing a normal join. You guys implemented a join? Yes. Okay, so you know, you got a hash join, you got a hash join. Hash join involves building a hash table. You're going to have to hash a key. You got to uh, insert into a, a, a hash table. When you do a probe, you got to again hash the key. You got to do a key comparison. You got to follow chains, all of that, right? Here, it's just a, okay, code 10, index into an array, not null, there's a match, and that's it. And that whole thing can be vectorized. It's a very simple operation to do a lookup. Does that make sense? If sales name was a foreign key to vehicle name, would you do this automatically? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good question. So there, there are cases where we do things automatically, and then when I talk about the future, we're going to go to an extreme on this. Okay. So that's uh, uh, joins. Aggregations, we do the same thing. Now, this, this slide's very detailed, so just follow my words and, and not necessarily look too much at this. but. Uh, we have two forms of aggregation pushdown. Uh, this is single table aggregation pushdown. This is something, it's called vector transformation. It's doing aggregations above a join. And it's kind of, a, you know, this is complicated, right? This, you can't make much meaning by just looking at, at this graph. But um, let, let's talk about this first. Um, what we're doing here is imagine you have a select sum from this table with a predicate, right? Normally, again, with that volcano model, right, you're sending back every passing row to another operator and that operator is then adding and adding and adding and adding one row at a time maybe it does a batch of rows at a time right but it's taking it's doing a couple of things one is it's doing it it's copying the symbol into a buffer the other operator is reading that buffer then it's looking up an aggregate and it's adding it it's, it's quite expensive um, what we're doing here is we're saying you know what, let's leverage the format. This was dictionary encoded. And if it's dictionary encoded, 
we can use the dictionary codes and aggregate against the dictionary codes and the distinct symbols. And then we can do that all at the scan layer and then only project back a partial aggregate result to the higher level operator. Okay, so that's, that's the techniques that we're doing for aggregation. I have an example of this. Vector transformation, I'm not going to go into this. All I'm going to say is, uh, again, this is a paper that we have in ICDE 2018, I think. Um, uh, it's a very novel technique that basically pushes um, aggregations down and, and joins down into the scan layer. So basically, instead of actually sending all these rows back up, up, up across the operators, the joint operator and the aggregation operators, we do everything in the scan operator, and, and that's that. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about this. This is kind of cool, something that you, you probably don't think about, but we have to think about it in industry. Um, very large numbers. Anybody know how very large numbers are, are encoded? There's a, a, a variety of different formats. Um, and by very large, I'm talking about like, let's say you know, 30 plus digits. You know, of, It's something that doesn't fit in 64-bit, uh, in, in a 64-bit register. Um, Oracle supports a software implemented type for number. You might think of a number as just a register, a 60, an int or whatever, right? Or long. We treat it as a sequence of bytes. Okay. When each uh, set of each byte represents a digit uh, up to 100, so it's 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 base 100. So you have the first byte indicates like an exponent as well as a the sign plus or minus. We're talking numerics, right? Numerics. We're talking numerics. So, okay. So this is but the and how it's implemented. I don't know how you guys put it. Okay, so so we basically have a and each operation on a number type is like hundreds of cycles, literally hundreds of cycles, as opposed to one cycle for doing um, a, 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 sim, a, a a register operation. So let's walk through an example of how we support very large numbers. So imagine you have a select sum of a from table t, where grouped by j comma k. Okay, so you're doing a sum on a grouping by j comma k, and let's suppose this is your table. Okay, these are your grouping columns J and K, and that's your measure column A. Okay, what we do is we create this frequency table, and this frequency table on the x-axis are the dictionary codes. These are, imagine these are dictionary codes, okay, they, they map to actual symbols, just for the, for, to illustrate this example here. So, you're going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, and this is 10,001, all the way to 51,819, etc. Okay, that's the x-axis. On the y-axis, you have the groups, the distinct groups. So the possible combinations of groups are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, if you look at all these values over here. Right? Now what we do is we walk through each row, and we add a count. So if I go to 0, 1, that maps to this group, I index into 51,819, and I bump up a count here that says I've seen it one time. And I do the same thing for each one of these values, 51,819 again, for the other group, I bump it up, I do this, I bump it up, and in the end, I basically have this table that says, how many times have I seen these dictionary codes for these different groups? Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, what we do is we will aggregate across each group by multiplying the frequency times that dictionary symbol. So it will say uh, code 0 shows up 0 times, so I don't need to multiply it. But this guy shows up one time, so I need to grab its code, look it up in the dictionary, and multiply it. And so this is basically the operations, zero times the symbol, plus zero times the next symbol, and so on. Why do we do this? Question. Yeah. I was wondering, if you have very large numbers, then I would assume that there's not as many matchings to specific, like that you wouldn't have um, the same dictionary, um, it, or, or the, there would be a larger dictionary. And I was wondering how, how that relates to the grouping, or if, there's, or if you're mapping like a set of numbers to the dictionary. If you're mapping, so are you saying if the number of groups is too large or if the number of dictionary symbols? There could be very, a lot of distinct numbers. Ah, okay. Then you have dictionary codes for each of those numbers. And Got it. So it seems like it, it may not be helping as much as... You, absolutely right. So you've, you've identified some of the weaknesses of this. So it, the question was, 
I, I think if, you, if I understand your question right, it's, it's possible that you might have one everywhere here, for example, because it's so um, diverse, I guess, that's the right word. And so, you know, every one of these codes only shows up in one particular group, or maybe they show up in all the groups, or whatever it is. And so you, you basically end up multiplying everything. Um, and that is a, a weakness of this. It's, it depends, so it's, it's a, it's, it, it depends on the data and how the data is actually organized. In the case, and also, it depends on how many groups you have. If you have many groups, and this table starts to become very large because you have many distinct symbols and many groups, it's going to be a very expensive operation to go through this for every single group. But just to, just to finish off what the idea here is, is we're basically replacing addition with multiplication, right? Every addition, if I had to add each one of these values up and sum up the same value, and if I can replace that, if it, let's say it's 10 times 5, I'd rather do 10 times 5 as opposed to adding up 5 10 times. And this is like an, an obvious thing you would think about in terms of factoring, but it's very important for software implemented types because each one of these operations is so many, so many cycles, 80, 100, 100 some cycles. So as, as you were saying, it does depend on the workload in terms of when this actually kicks in or not. Does that make sense? You understand that one? Question again. Are you choosing the group? The group, so uh, the groups can be analyzed by, by, uh, by walking through the columns of J and K. So you will, as you walk through J, you'll identify how many distinct symbols are in J. You walk through K, how many distinct symbols are K. You multiply the two, like kind of like a multi-dimensional array to get the max possible code. And that's the, that's the table that you create. And then when you want to index into it, you take this and this, multiply them together, and that's how you index into the table. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip through uh, several slides here in the interest of time. So numbers, uh, joins are made faster, and memory expressions I'll skip over here, um, dynamic scans I'll skip, and I'll move over straight into uh, this thing called in-memory plus extra data. So, this is number three, where we're bringing in memory into the storage tier. So with um, Oracle, we have something called Exadata. Exadata is a database machine that we build from scratch, utilizing basically the best of read hardware. So the fastest networking, the best uh, SSD drives, a lot of memory, a lot of flash, right? Uh, we build that from scratch, and we build it to run Oracle as fast as possible. So like the last slide, that rack, how much is that? The good, good previous slide, how much is that box? That's a good question. It's definitely in the millions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we sell them in various different configurations, but it's definitely in the millions. But sh it's amazing how many people buy them. <laughs> it's like amazing. It's a, it's a billion dollar business for Oracle. Okay. Um, ah, okay. So. On Exadata, you have the compute nodes and you have storage nodes, okay? Compute nodes is where all the higher level SQL operator processing happens. Joins and aggregations and sorting and all that jazz happens there. On the storage nodes is where you are closest to the data where it sits in the SSD drives. So that's where you can actually do some fast filtering here and then only send back the rows that pass through the network to the compute nodes, right? Put in the context we discussed last week, this is a shared disk distributed database. Correct. Okay. So what you had without in memory is we have also some flash that's sitting on these storage nodes and how we use that flash is we use it as a cache. And this goes to what Andy was, was talking about earlier is that there, we actually have it as a cache in the sense that the hottest data that you're accessing will be moved from the SSD drives into uh, the flash cache. And now, you will, and it will also be stored in a columnar representation. Now, the beauty of this is that on the compute nodes, you're limited to how much DRAM you have, like one and a half terabytes of, of memory, which you might think is a lot, but in, again, real enterprises, that's nothing. Okay, it's, it's like a drop in the bucket. You really need the hundreds of terabytes that Flash gives you. And once you have all of that memory, you can basically do some really nifty storage tiering now. You can have some, most of your hottest data sitting on your compute nodes, and if you run out of memory, no problem. 
it will automatically get populated into the flash cache sitting on the storage nodes. Now, how, do, how does a query work? Okay, so imagine you're doing a scan, a full table scan says, you know, select um, from my phone book all people in my address that live in California, whatever. It's going to go through here. It's going to say, okay, I've exhausted everything that's over here. The rest of my table is sitting on my storage. And it's going to say everything is cached in my flash cache. It will utilize the same vectorization techniques that we've talked about, the same improvements that we make for joins and aggregations and so on. It leverages all of that. It's just doing it from flash. And so you have to bring it from flash into the DRAM that's local to that storage node. But then after that, you do the same techniques and then you send it back up. Anybody, does that make sense? And this is just the form of storage tiering. It gives you a much larger column store and it allows you to place data where it belongs. Hot data in the most expensive memory, that's the fastest. Warm data in the flash cache and cold data sitting on your persistent store, right? On your, on your disk. Okay, these are just some performance numbers. Um, I, I think we can skip that. And let's skip this. Um, anybody interested in fault tolerance? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So let me tell you about how we achieve fault tolerance. Okay. Um, on, uh, we, we basically maintain a cluster of nodes. We call it rack. Okay. On rack, you can have many different nodes. Let's say four nodes in this example. And you have a column store on each one of these nodes. Each one of these nodes has memory. You can put a separate, you can put a column store in there. Um, what you can do is you can bring your data into this column store and you can duplicate it on any one of these other nodes. So for example, this red IMCU is duplicated on this node and this blue is duplicated on that and black is duplicated there. And you can have at least two nodes that you can duplicate against so that if anything happens to this node, queries just need to be redirected to the node that has that IMCU, right? It's really simple. It's as simple as that. Um, you can do even better by having full duplication where this red IMCU is stored everywhere and that gives you both availability as well as performance. Performance because every access now when you go to it will be local. You're not doing a remote access to another node to fetch its contents to, and, and run that query. Everything is local. Okay. Um, so that's how we achieve fault tolerance. It's, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Every, at the IMCU level, every IMCU, which is at half a, a million rows, gets duplicated. I'm going to skip data guard and I'll, I'll move straight to intelligent automation. Andy, how are we doing on time? We're okay? Yeah, 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Number four is intelligent automation. This is where we're trying to be a lot smarter. So far everything I've told you for the most part is the DBA or you, you know, the, you, the user has to direct us in some way. Says, hey, bring this table into a memory or hey, create this join group, right? Um, we want to be a lot smarter. Um, you guys work, all work with Andy. Andy's the creator of self-driving databases. Larry Ellison stole the name. He did steal the name. I did. <laughs> That's right. Um, so made money out of it. we made money out of it. Um, so anyways, uh, so that's what we're, we're moving towards, right? Self-driving databases. Um, I have a, a separate talk uh, later on today that that's talking more about uh, how we achieve this. Um, but the idea here is here's a picture of this DBA, poor DBA. And the DBA is saying, I have to manually manage what to put in this column store and what to keep out. I don't, I don't know what tables are hot. I don't know what's cold. I don't know what's warm. I have no idea what queries you're going to run, right? But as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's a column store. So once this store becomes full of tables, that's it. The DBA has to decide what to evict out, what to bring in, right? And the desired outcome here is you want to keep hot objects in memory and remove the colder objects, right? So that's what we had. Okay, what we have now is something smarter, right? Here, we will observe the access patterns. We have something what we call a heat map. Heat map basically says at the very smallest granularity, which for us is a block, and the block has some number of rows. At the block level, we will say how often has it been accessed, how hot is it, 
and how it's been accessed. Was it accessed because of scans, a DML, what, how? Right? So we observe the access patterns. Once we observe the patterns, we'll classify the data. Right? We'll say hot, intermediate, cool, uh, cool data. And once we classify the data, then we take action. We'll bring in the hot data in, we'll remove the cold data. Very simple, very straightforward. We take it to an even more complicated level where we'll do, we'll do it not just at the table level or the partition level, but even at the column level. So we'll say something like, this column is being used to aggregate on. It's a measure column. And this column is being used to predicate on. Okay. Now, if I know that this column is for predication or for pred predicate evaluation, and this column is for aggregation, I could format them in a different way. I might use dictionary encoding for one and maybe um, another compressed uh, format for the other. Because dictionary encoding in order to, involves getting the code, looking up in the dictionary, getting the symbol. It's a couple of levels of indirection. And that's expensive. But it's, it's really fast for scans because I just need to look at the bit codes. I, don't never, I never have to decompress it. Whereas aggregation, I need to actually go get that symbol from the dictionary. And then I need to add it. So why should I dictionary encode that? Maybe I should just keep it uncompressed so I have the symbols right there. So this is where you can start becoming a lot smarter about knowing how your, your data is accessed, how the columns are accessed, how they should be formatted. Maybe none of these, maybe these four columns are never accessed. Get rid of them, compress them, or if you want to be safe, compress them or evict them out of the columns altogether. Okay, so anyways, so that's how we're trying to remove the guesswork out of the picture and just start being a lot, lot smarter. And this gets complicated because you guys all worked on with the buffer cache. Imagine you have a mixed workload where sometimes you're going to run OLTP, sometimes you're going to run uh, analytics. How much memory do you dedicate for the column store versus how much do you dedicate for the buffer cache? Right? H how do you determine that? Uh, how do you know what the behavior is going to be today t versus tomorrow versus the next day and so on? So all of these factors have to come into play and you have to be very elastic in, in being able to switch from one to the other. And you have to be very, very fast and accurate. No customer wants to move over to Oracle's autonomous database and all of a sudden A, experience worse performance and B, experience like inconsistent performance. Those, like, those are two terrible things. If, if at the very least you want to be consistently bad, that would be my suggestion. If you're going to be bad, be consistently bad so that the user knows like, okay, at least I know what to expect today and tomorrow and so on. All right, so um, I'm going to skip through some more things. I will talk briefly about, oh, question. Yeah, there was a parameter uh, to control like the... Yes. What value does that take? So this is, this is a finer grain. This is saying, um, for example, when the column store is full, the action we could take is just evict out cold columns. That's it. We never will decide what should go in to replace it. That's just based on your query. Whatever you touch, you bring in. That's one mode. Another mode is, no, we'll be smarter. We'll evict and tell you what to bring in. And yet another mode is an extreme mode. That's where like, hands off, we'll do everything. We'll decide from the get-go what should be in the column store. From the get-go, what columns should be in there, how to compress it, and so on. Do you make any decision about what what's actually in the data? Like, look at the values and say, oh, well, this has order dates that are beyond, you know, three months, therefore you don't expect it. Good question. The enough? We, we just look at, um, we, we just look at frequency, uh, NDV, right? That's all, that's all we really look at. You could, we do look at if it's a date column, for example. Let's give a date column. If it's a date column, we could be smarter in terms of how we encode it. We can code the months separate from the year, from the dates, and we can get better compression. If it's a number column, we can compress them with a binary representation. JSON, we can do. So we, we do look at data types to compress them in a much more efficient representation, but we don't look at it to derive meaning out of it. Now, that's kind of another level. Once we, t once we have the queries together in a repository, and we have the data, and we have access patterns, we can do things like that. You're legal, you're legal that. Uh, I don't know if we're, so I say we could do it. <laughs> so we, we haven't actually done anything like that yet. Um, because, well, see, here's the thing is, the data likely will be encrypted as it is. And so, you know, we can't do anything. I'm not even, uh, and NDV even is difficult. You can do it from the dictionary, but other than that, you can't.
Any other questions? Question. Um, are there any kind of like, I guess like kind of like game theory like type like um, considerations? Like you're like, okay, how much would it save for me to move this over here? And like, you know, then once it's like, once you've hit that amount of time, then pull it out. Like that kind of great. Thing. Yeah, great question. So that is, um, see, I, I, that's kind of our expert system. I don't, it's not machine learning, but it's like, it's an expert system. It's taking into account, again, the, let's just take simplest metrics are how often has it been scanned? How much space does it consume? And how has it been scanned? Those are kind of the, like the three very simple metrics. And from that, you can divide, d design an equation that uh, meets the threshold that you optimize for. Um, the other part of it that's missing is time, I think. When, when has it been accessed? You take all those into account and you've got a pretty smart system without anything more complicated than that. There's, you can go further. You can look at correlation between multiple columns, correlation across multiple tables, et cetera. Question in the back. How do you decide like when to like actually like because obviously like once you just say like okay I want this data to be hot data I need to you know convert it to column format or something like that. Yep. Um, how do you decide when to do that? Because obviously like that's a, that's pretty expensive if you're converting you know like half your table into column format. Yep. Or something like that. Good question. So the question is uh, how do you determine when to bring it into the column store automatically, right? Or, and when these options, okay, good, good question. So I'll answer the first one. When to bring it into memory is again, it's similar to what I was saying, those attributes. If I know, let's say there's a table that's not in memory and the, the column store is full. How often has this table been scanned? Not that often. How often have these tables been scanned that are in memory? Very often. Doesn't make sense to replace them. Once the number of scans for this table has increased above what any of these other tables have, then it makes sense to evict something out from the column store, bring something in. But it's tricky, right? Because you have to know, is that just for a short period of time and then it's not going to be accessed again? Um, and I paid all this, I, I spent a lot of CPU cycles to transpose it, bring it into memory, and now I'm done, like it's midnight and I don't need to run these reports again. So we try to be smart about ad identifying the access patterns before we take action. We're, we're actually a fairly conservative system um, and we will slowly make modifications. It's, it's, it's like any other system, expert system that you design, you're going to have feedback mechanisms in here, right? You're going to say, did I make the right decision that I just did? Uh, and if I didn't, like I learned from that, I remember that, and the next time this situation comes again, I'll be smarter about what I, what I bring in. I'll be honest with you, this is not a perfect system and there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Um, and that's where we're, we're trying to figure out what's the, how do we get the 80% of the benefit with 20% of, of the work so we can quickly get to it. Is that, okay, question over there. So if this is a zero one access pattern and both zero, table zero and table one are completely filling the column store, right? Okay. So like, you have to evict the first table if you want to bring the next table. Then yes. Like they are both like first I'll do a query on zero, then I'll do a query on then what do you do there? Like? Yes. Yeah, so what we'll do that, so the first thing we do, let's say zero and one are both hot, is what you're saying, right? They're both hot. And you don't have space for both zero and one. What do you do? First thing we do is we say which of these columns have not been accessed. Okay? Normally you have a table that's a very fat table or a fat table. Okay, let, let's look anybody familiar with TPCH? Okay, TPCH is a benchmark, the, the data warehouse benchmark. Okay. OLAP. It's an OLAP benchmark. Okay. TPCH has a table called line item. Line item has a column called L comment. L comment is never used, okay, in the in the queries that are in, in that particular benchmark. L comment for Oracle takes up about 20% of the space in memory. It's a gigantic var chart, not gigantic var chart, but it's, it's a large var chart string. And Oracle is very aggressive. We will dictionary encode it, which doesn't really make sense because they're all distinct symbols. Why the hell am I dictionary encoding? I'm not going to leverage it. But we do that because we assume you might scan against it. And if you're going to scan against it, dictionary encoding is the smartest thing. So going back to your example here is L comment is never used. Line item is hot. That's a hot table, but that column, L comment, is never used. So we'll evict it out or compress it just to be safe. And just that act of compressing it or evicting out might allow you to bring this other table in. Does that make sense? So we will try to first be very conservative and try to get both of those tables into the, into the column store by compressing columns. Okay. If that doesn't work, 
we take the next bigger action. If that doesn't work, we take the next bigger action. For, so for example, tables are usually partitioned, right? You can partition by date. Maybe the old dates, uh, partitions aren't needed. And you only care about the hottest dates. So you keep that in mind when you evict the old dates out. Does that make sense? Now, if you're in a situation where you, both of these are hot, then, then we, we stay conservative. We're not going to constantly populate, we evict, populate, evict. That's just going to add more cycles to do the population. So we'll choose one and, and live, live with the consequences. Okay. All right. I know I've, I'm like uh, running out of time here. So I'm just going to, oops, sorry, sorry. All right. Persistent memory. Okay. Let's just talk very quickly about persistent memory. Um, new silicon technology, capacity, performance, and price are between DRAM and flash. This is a, a nice little picture here that says, um, as you go from disk to flash to persistent memory to DRAM, you're going faster, 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 faster. Um, but at the same time, you're going higher cost, higher cost, higher cost per, per gigabyte. Okay. Eventually, PMEM is, is really expensive right now. It's, it's really expensive. Eventually, this will reduce in price, but flash is going to be even cheaper also. So it's very interesting how we put systems together with all this technology to get the, the best performance. Um, Intel calls this Optane DC persistent memory. DC is data center, I believe. Um, they're pretty much the only game in, in town right now. Okay, there's, a, there, there, there's others, but they're the only game in town right now. Um, reads at memory speed, much faster than flash. Writes survive power failure, unlike DRAM. Okay, you can imagine building, as, as Andy was saying, building a brand new storage engine built on top of persistent memory, right? It's tricky. Um, as Hideaki here, uh, you guys, he's going to give a talk uh, tomorrow um, on how you can leverage persistent memory. It can be tricky because it involves leveraging some new instructions to make sure that data is properly flushed all the way back to, to memory. Um, I won't go into the details of that. I will just bring up this slide here on how we are planning on using persistent memory for our in-memory column store. So, Today, as a baseline, you cannot necessarily fit all of your data in memory. That's the example some of us, you know, we've been talking about. So assume it doesn't fit in memory. So you're going to have disk, I'm sorry, disk plus memory. The queries then have to go against the column store in DRAM as well as the row store on disk, right? And DRAM DIMMs can go up to 128 gigabytes. No one buys it at that. It's very expensive. Um, so that's today's baseline. With PMEM, you can conceivably fit everything inside of a, a PMEM a DIM. Okay, it's three x more denser. Um, something called memory mode. This is really cool. Memory mode um, Intel supports. Um, it allows you to have a your persistent memory DIM and a uh, a DRAM DIM sitting on top. Okay, so when you access data, the DRAM DIM serves as a cache. So your hottest data sits in memory, in DRAM. And if it's not in that cache, then we'll bring it from the persistent memory DIM into the DRAM DIM. So the DRAM DIM just serves as a cache. It's wasted space in the sense that it's a cache. It's not like um, extra memory that you have. But the benefit is you are accessing PMAM almost as fast as, as DRAM. Okay, so that's called uh, memory mode. The hottest tables are cached in DRAM for the fastest access. And these DIMMs can be quite large, the 512 gigabytes. And then this just uh, talks about using our latest Oracle uh, 20C and some of the techniques. And the reason why I mention this is we ran this, this benchmark where we use SSBs. It's SSBs another benchmark called Star Schema Benchmark. It's kind of uh, based off of, of TPCH. Um, and uh, there we showed DRAM about 384 gigabytes. The table didn't fit entirely memory. This was a progress bar but that completed. We processed 18 billion rows and it took 130 seconds, okay, when it didn't fit entirely in memory. And then we use memory mode with persistent memory and it like dropped by 10x, right? And 10x faster. And it took 12 seconds to go to 18 billion rows. And then we just added um, Oracle 20C, which has some cool techniques for making joins faster. And we just showed that they can go an additional, you know, 4x faster than that. And the main point I want to mention is this really is a game changer for us. We're looking at, at persistent memory more as expanded memory, larger capacity. So now you could fit everything into memory. Gone are the days where you need to put everything on disk. Okay, you got terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of, of memory. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to skip the converged analytics and I'm just going to open it up to questions. But the main, I'll just talk about this slide here. The main thing about Oracle, uh, one of the things that we're trying to push with Oracle is you don't need to have a separate storage engine for a document store or a spatial store, a Neo4j or Graph or AI or IoT or, or uh, you know, treat your database as a file system. Oracle is trying to position itself as a one-stop shop. Right? You can do everything on a single database and it's got a ton of benefits. One being security. You don't want to have to migrate your relational data out to bring it into yet a graph database just so you can run graph queries on it. Right? Uh, there's a customer, God, what is it? It's an ex-data customer in Europe that they have a, um, they build a graph database um, and they use a, a graph to represent transactions between uh, different people on their on their PayPal sort of system, and they every every uh, edge in their graph node is a transaction. But they have to take their data out of a uh, relational store, bring it into the the graph store, and then they run their query. And that takes one some time, and second, there's always this security violation now because you're taking this unencrypted data out of the uh, the, the database. Same thing for a document store. With MongoDB, there's MongoDB, but you can also store JSON nicely inside of your, your, your relational database. Okay, so I'm not going to talk so much about this. I'll just sort of skip through this um, and leave it at that, okay? So last thing is just, this is this innovation summary. I, I wanna make it very clear that, uh, you know, th this is 2014 when we came out. All of these little bullets here are like, kind of massive projects and Oracle is kind of committed to uh, in memory and um, you know our roadmap going oops I'm kind of drawing it up higher from 20C to 21C and so on we're super committed because we feel like now is the time and memory is becoming readily available it's becoming cheaper it's becoming larger um, the hardware technology is all there the requirements again from the real-time enterprises is there and so as a result our features need to be there um, and the main drivers for us are the self-managing in memory database everything needs to be autonomous um, really looking at everything not just relational but spatial text graph etc um, and also vectorizing all of our operators not just our simple scans and so on okay I think that's it I'll skip that I'll skip that I'll skip that and I'll open it to any questions you may have if you have any. All right, any questions? I was wondering about the 6.5 about being able to support multiple types of databases. Yeah. I was wondering, um, are you actually having the information in different, like for the graph versus the relational, or do you have it stored in one way and then you're just able to work on it? Great question. So um, the question is, how do you, how are we representing this? Is it a single representation of your data when you want to use it for a graph query versus a relational query, or is it like a you know multiple representations? I had that right. Okay. So I, I I went through those slides very quickly, but let me explain. So what we do for graph, or let's say I'll say JSON initially right now for text. Okay. So the techniques that we're doing for text, spatial, JSON, whatever it is, is representing the data in a much more efficient manner in a in memory in a column store so it's kind of like think of dictionary encoding doing some tricks like that to represent your data more efficiently all right i have one quick question yeah so in addition to having a database systems background and knowledge from taking a course like this how important for if you're looking to hire somebody would be people have a background in maybe testing database systems or query optimization oh yeah Great question. Okay, so um, when I when we look to hire people, uh, okay, so first thing is this: I always look for people that are enthusiastic, smart, and excited about the technology. That's that's first and foremost because we have we have mathematicians, we have a mechanical engineer, we have a chemist, we have all sorts of people that are working on database systems. Um, the folks that actually have a solid background in database systems, however. They, uh, it, that's like, um, I don't know, what's, what's the word, the holy grail in some, in some ways. Because we interface with, uh, we're, the, we're the core storage engine team, but I interfa we interface with the optimizer team, we interface with the exadata team, we interface with the hardware team. I have a background in compilers and computer architecture, um, so I didn't have a background in database systems at all. Easy to do. Let me make it, make it more simple. Okay. You have two candidates, 
equal background, equal uh, education. Uh -huh. One is a JavaScript programmer. Okay. One is a query optimizer person. Who do you hire? I hire the query optimizer <laughs> person. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa, better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wild, I'll be stressed out. Could never be sun. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The boards in the bushes, St. Nas in the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. I sip it through those who don't realize that drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.